Hey guys, all right. So this is this is fun. This is different. This is going to be great. You're in for a real special treat. Uh, uh, our care pastor here at Seattle Revival Center, and my pastor is here. Uh, she's she's you could say the mother of Seattle Revival Center. She's one of my spiritual moms as well. We're uh, you're like I said, you're in for a real special treat. Hey, would you join me in welcoming and honoring Pastor Gail Fleming as she comes? Pastor Gail, would you come? All right. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Stay six feet away. Oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Nobody share. Nobody share that, right? Um, Gail, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, pause with a purpose. This is going to be good. Amen. All right. Well, have fun. <laughs> have fun. You. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. It's May 10th, 2020. Last Tuesday, we reached our 50-day goal of being in lockdown and some of you are real happy about it and you don't want to go back to work and others of you can't wait to get back to work but my name's Gail Fleming I'm one of the pastors here at Seattle Revival Center actually I'm a care pastor here at Seattle Revival Center and I've been talking to a lot of you throughout the week and uh, I just want you to know that you're amazing people and you encourage me as I talk to you. I'm just amazed at what God is doing in your lives. And so I want to welcome you to this service today. I want to welcome those who are online. We're so happy to have you today. Um, uh, we just feel like God has given us a whole new platform here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what a privilege and what it on an honor it is to be with you today. So today I'd like to... Um, just make a few comments about women in, uh, in Jesus' time and the way that Jesus ministered to them, just because it is Mother's Day. And uh, I would love to um, uh, just let you know that Jesus did more for women than anyone in history, than anyone carrying a sign or anyone getting a law passed or anything else. Everywhere he went, I've just been reading through the Gospels about women, and he elevated them everywhere he went. He healed them. The first woman that was an evangelist was a Samaritan woman who had been married five times. She wasn't even Jewish. And uh, he just loved them. He, he, he drove demons out of them. He had women as his disciples. Uh, they followed him. They ministered to him. He raised the widow's son because he knew that that woman had no other source of income if her son died. Uh, he, he watched the widow give everything she had in the offering and said uh, that, that that would be remembered for, for her throughout eternity. It's just amazing the way God ministered and changed the culture of his day. He treated women with the same dignity that men were treated. And in that day, that wasn't so. Uh, women were second-class citizens in the days of Jesus, but yet he made them first-class citizens. And that wasn't how he meant it in the beginning. He created us co-heirs, co-equal. Paul brought that out in his scripture that there's neither female nor male with the Lord, but we're all one in Christ. Um, our roles are very different, uh, but we are co-heirs, co-laborers, co-workers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and that just um, uh, changes our whole paradigm of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people haven't caught on yet, um, but we've caught on. And I just want to say that Pastor Darren just so honors the women in this house. So uh, Pastor Darren, kudos to you today. That's not what I'm preaching on today, though. I'm preaching about pauses. Uh, we've been in this lockdown for some time, and uh, some people are calling it a pause. Some are calling it a reset. Uh, some are call it shelter in place or stay-at-home order orders. And many other names that are not so nice and some that are nice. Uh, nevertheless, we're still in it. We're still kind of we're still kind of right in the mess of it, but yet we're starting to come out of it slowly but surely. And uh, we're trying to walk in wisdom and be safe, and that's all good things. So um, since this all started, there have been three instances in Scripture that keep coming up to me. They keep coming back to me. So uh, let's begin this morning just by praying, okay? Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your um, 
message to us. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ that is more powerful than Superman, that is more powerful than any locomotive, any power on the face of the earth. We thank you for this beautiful gospel, this word today. And Lord, I just pray today that what you want me to forget, I'll forget. And what you want me to remember, I'll remember. And the words that we speak today would be glorifying to you in every way because you're such a beautiful God. Such your, you're such a beautiful master. And you're such a beautiful person. So we honor you today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start in Joshua, and we'll just go right to Joshua chapter 1, because there's a three-day pause here that um, is real important, and, it's, and, it, and it kind of sets the stage for everything. So, uh, and this is how God worked with Joshua. So in chapter 1, verse 1 of Joshua, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Get going. Cross this Jordan River, you and all the people. Cross to the country I'm giving to the people of Israel. I'm giving you every square inch of the land you set your foot on, just as I promised Moses. And then he went on to tell him all the land that he's going to give him. And so when we drop down to verse 10, it says, Then Joshua gave orders to the people's leaders. He said, Go through the camp and give this order to the people. Pack your bags in three days, you will cross this Jordan River to enter and take the land God, your God, is giving you to possess. So um, God told them to get up and go, but I noticed down here that Joshua said you've got three days to pack. So maybe it took them three days to pack. I don't understand the three-day move, but I understood it more when I got down to chapter 2. Now remember, Joshua had assurance from God that he was going to take the land. And then the people in verse 16 and 17 answered Joshua and said, everything you commanded us we'll do. Wherever you send us we will go. We obeyed Moses to the letter. We'll also obey you. We just pray that God, your God, will be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who questions what you say and refuses to obey whatever you command, he will be put to death strength, courage, Joshua. So Joshua had the encouragement of the Lord. He had the encouragement of the people. But right here on the same day that God spoke to him, Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent out from Shittim two men as spies. Go look over the land. Check out Jericho. So they left and they arrived at the house of a harlot named Rahab and stayed there with her. Now, I don't know what they were spying out in that land, but they found out something more that encouraged Joshua. The woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said yes to the men who came looking for him. Two men did come to me, but I didn't know where they'd come from. At dark, when the gate was about to be shut, the men left. But I have no idea where they went. Hurry up, chase them. You can still catch them. She had flax that were spread upon her roof, and so the men, the men set chase down the Jordan and to the fords. Down for the night, the woman came up to them on the roof and said, I know that God has given you this land. We're all afraid. Everyone in the country feels hopeless. We heard how God dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you left Egypt, and what he did to the two Amorite kings of the Jordan. Sihon and Og, whom you put under a holy curse and destroyed. We heard it and our hearts sank. We all had the wind knocked out of us. And all because of you, you and God, your God, God of the heavens above and God of the earth below. So these men jumped down through the window that night and went back to Jordan. They got back there on the third day to the camp. And they told Joshua everything he needed to know. So Joshua had three things happen to him during this three-day pause. Number one, God spoke to him and told him to go. Number two, the people began to pack and they got behind Joshua. So he knew the people were with him. And number three, the land he was going to destroy encouraged him. They were scared to death. And Joshua, uh, being the man he was, 
got even some more encouragement from that. So he was ready to go. So during those three days was a real important time for Joshua's life. And God was developing him. He would brought him up through Moses. He was a young man who stayed at the tent of meeting, stayed in the presence of the Lord, uh, stayed with the Lord during those quiet times when Moses would be out ministering and doing things like that. But Joshua, he always hung around the presence of the Lord. And during that pause time, God spoke to him very clearly. So much of what he sowed in to his past, much of the habits that he developed during that time of being under the mentorship of Moses uh, came to fruition that day at the Jordan River when God told him, I'm giving you the land. I'm giving everything I promised you. You're not going to be disappointed. You're going to have a land that's rich flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you the borders of all this land. And Joshua had to have been so encouraged. That day had to be a highlight of his life. He had to look back at those three days when he was an old man and say, oh my God, what he did for me. And we're in a pause right now, and our pause is longer than than Joshua's. But God did something very, very particular and very uh, in vogue with what he does, and that is build people up and strengthen them. Pauses are meant to think, are meant to meditate, are meant to build up, are meant to strengthen, are meant to change us. And I believe that this pause uh, changed Joshua, encouraged him, and set him on the path of getting his inheritance from God. The second one I'd like to look at today, so I I just want to make one point just before we move on to the second one, and that is my first point and the most important point is that number one, the devil is afraid of you. You can feel like you don't have any power staying home right now. You can feel like you're alone. You can feel like your friends are abandoned. You can feel like God's abandoned. You can feel like all kinds of things. But I'm going to tell you something today. The devil's afraid of you. He's afraid of you. The enemies of the Lord, the enemies of the Jews were afraid of them. And today the devil's afraid of you. And I hear some people saying already, little old me, what am I to the devil? You are powerful because Jesus Christ lives inside of you. You are more powerful than you will ever know and you'll ever imagine in this life. When you get to heaven, you're going to see all the things you could have done or would have done or should have done. But right now, God is letting us know that the devil is afraid of us. So let's go to Matthew 4. for another pause. And in Matthew chapter four, I'll just turn to there real quick. And I'm, I'm gonna start in, in verse three, and in chapter three, I'm sorry, verse 13 to 14. Jesus then appeared, arriving at the Jordan River from Galilee. He wanted John to baptize him, but John objected. I'm the one who needs to be baptized, not you. But Jesus insisted, do it. God's work, putting things right all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. So John did it. The moment Jesus came up out of the baptismal waters, the skies opened up and he saw God's spirit. It looked like a dove descending and landing on him. And along with the spirit, a voice, this is my son, chosen and marked by my love, the light of my life. Jesus was the delight of his father's life, yet right after that baptism, he was led out into the desert. Because he was born a man, he had to go through the same testing that we go through, and that is overcoming the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It says, next, Jesus was taken into the wild by the Spirit for the test. The devil was ready to give it. Jesus prepared for the test, by fasting 40 days and 40 nights. That left him, of course, in a state of extreme hunger, which the devil took advantage of in the first test. Since you are God's son, speak the word that will turn these stoves into loaves of bread. And you all know about the next three tests, so I won't read about all of that. But during that 40-day stay in the wilderness, he was fasting and praying, preparing himself. This was a pause for him. 
He didn't even really start to minister until he came out from that test and he came out of that wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit and his ministry began in, in one, in, with signs and wonders and miracles. He went about doing good everywhere he went, healing all sorts of diseases. And I wonder sometimes if we don't go through those same, that very same test. I mean, we've had to overcome the flesh. We've had to overcome the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And in our generation, it's all around us all the time. We can go to a restaurant usually anytime we want. Right now we can. We have plenty of food. We have plenty of material goods. Uh, we're a nation that's been extremely blessed by God. There's just this wonderful favor upon our nation. And yet uh, uh, we find ourselves having to pass the test. Uh, do we feed ourselves when we hurt? Uh, do we, do we uh, look forward to the next fun thing? Uh, do we want the biggest car? Uh, all these things uh, we need to walk through. It's not wrong to want these things, but when they rule your life, when that's what you're working for, when that's what you're striving for, you're missing out on God's very best for you. God has such a wonderful purpose for you, such a wonderful uh, intimate relationship for you. He wants to, he wants to bless you. He wants to wrap you up in his arms. And sometimes when we have all of these things around us all the time, the Lord gets pushed to the side. But in that pause, in that time in the desert, he fasted and he prayed and he took the time to get close to his father. And when he came out of the wilderness, he was doing everything he saw his father father do he said I can only do what the father do does and he just watched his father and he did everything his father did and I just my challenge you know the challenge to me today is am I watching my father am I watching him do uh, what he's doing am I doing what he's doing am I speaking to people the way he would speak to people he ministered with such kindness such compassion and such love and am I doing that? Is that my heart? Or are these other things pulling at my life because it's funner to take a vacation or it's funner to go to Mexico or it's funner to go see the grandkids. It's, it's funner to do this. And there's nothing wrong with those things. Please don't ever think that at all. God gave us those things. He's blessed us with those things. But everything has to be in its right priority. And what happened here was overcoming all of those things. He came out in power. He came out ready to preach the gospel. He, he came out ready to fulfill his destiny. So we do the same thing in our life. And sometimes, just because we live in such a blessed land, we have to go through that test time and time again. And so uh, there's a place in our life where we overcome all those things. They're not necessary anymore. Yes, we can take them or we can leave them. God has delivered us so much from the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that that we don't need him anymore. We can take him or leave him. God blesses us and we say, God, why are you blessing me? He just wants to bless you. He just wants to love you because you've overcome those things because you pressed into where he is and you have that intimate relationship with him and you find yourself blessed beyond your wildest imagination and then you keep on getting blessed and, and, and you don't understand why, but it's because you serve a good God. He's a wonderful God. He's not waiting up there with a hammer to beat you up when you fail. He's not trying to coach you all the time he's trying to love you into a relationship with him so that you're ministering out of that relationship with him that's the easiest way to minister that's the easiest way to live that's the most wonderful experience you can ever have in your life the trouble is we do it kind of part-time and I'll just leave that for you so let's go to the um the second point which tells me that once we've passed these things, that you can come out walking in the full power of God. You are full of the power of God. So number one, the devil is afraid of you. And number two, you are full of the power of the living God. And you are walking in that today. So let's go to the third pause, which, of, which was a 40-day wait in the upper room. And we go into John 21, 19 through 20, if you turn there with me. So after this, and this is after the crucifixion, after this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. And this is how he did it. Simon Peter from Cana in Galilee and the brother Zebedee and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, 
I'm going fishing. Now these men were kind of hid in an in a upper room at that time because they were afraid of the Jews. And they got tired of it. Peter got tired of it, which doesn't surprise me. And Peter said, heck with this, I'm going fishing. A lot of people are in uh, lockdown right now and they're tired of this. Heck with this, I'm going to the store. Heck with this, I'm going for a walk. And uh, Peter said, I'm going fishing. But guess who he met fishing? That was Jesus. And that was one of the last miracles that Jesus did was all, all the, the miracle of the fishes on the seashore. And he healed up Simon, Simon Peter right there. But then he told him to wait. Wait in the upper room until I come, until you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so they went, and we go into Acts chapter 2. They were in the upper room. And in the upper room, the scriptures in Acts chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, I think it says. Acts chapter 1, I'm sorry, 13 and 14. <laughs> I'll start it at verse 12. So they left the mountain called Olives and returned to Jerusalem. It was a little over half a mile, and they went to the upper room that they had been using as a meeting place. And this is their pause. They agreed they were in this for good, completely together in prayer, the women included. Also, Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers were with them. And during this time, Peter stood up and they replaced the apostle that had, that had sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And Matthias was uh, chosen during that time. And um, they took care of that thing. And then it says in chapter 2, when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, a gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. That turned out to be the most powerful prayer meeting there ever was. And these men were baptized, these women were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they went out to preach the gospel. They took, Jesus took off, where John the Baptist left off, and the apostles, the disciples, and even the women, yes, took up where Jesus left off. And they, from that meeting, they preached the gospel to their whole known world. So pauses are not a bad thing. And I hear a lot of people calling this time a pause. And uh, we're, in the, we're past the 50 days of this pause. But I want to challenge you that uh, the third point I want to make is that you're endued with power from on high. And you're commissioned by God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have three things going for us. Uh, number one, the devil's afraid of you. Uh, number two, you're full of the power of God. And number three, you are commissioned of God to preach the gospel however you do it. Now some of you say, I'm not a preacher, I know, but we all, we all preach the gospel. Our behavior is our biggest preaching mechanism. The way we treat one another, the way we treat people, the way we minister, the way we talk, the way we raise our children, the way we love our husband, the way we love our wives. Uh, that's our biggest noise maker because that speaks loud because people are watching you. People are either drawing to you or they're drawn away from you. And God wants people drawn. Jesus lives in us. People should be being drawn to us. So during this time, uh, God's been doing some things that are very, um, they're not like these great big things, but they're subtle things. Like I notice my time frame is more in order than it's ever been. My day is, my day is planned out more than ever before. Um, and, and because I have the freedom, uh, I have to ask God what to do. Because I could be free and just do what I want. Uh, but I, I get to ask the Lord, now, where should I spend these few hours or those few hours? And I, I know my obligations, but each day is different for me now because I'm retired, of course. Uh, and, and I can kick back and sit in an easy chair and watch Fox News or CNN and, and just be all scared half to death and, and uh, mad and, and all those other things. But I choose not to do that. I choose 
I choose to not walk in any kind of fear. And I just want to address that fear for a moment. There are people out here that are walking in all kinds of fear today. We do not walk in that fear. We walk in wisdom, that's true. But we don't walk in that kind of fear because we don't fear death in any way, shape, or form. We walk in the power of God, but we walk in, in an awe of God or what he's able to do. When our eyes are upon him, none of this other stuff matters. When we're in that communion with him, these things have no power over us. When we get out of that place of communion, those things get power over us. We can get fearful. We can get scared. Uh, many years ago, God gave me a vision, and and I probably repeated this many times, but in that vision, I was walking down a path, and on the sides of the path were snakes and all kinds of things that were scary to me. And uh, when I looked at them, I got scared. But when I looked at Jesus, I paid no attention to them whatsoever. And God wants us in that place during this pause time. Uh, some things are coming down the pike for us. We, quite, we don't quite know what they are yet. Uh, but we're not afraid of them. Uh, we know that God is working all this for his good. Now, I don't believe that this virus came from God because God's not the author of evil. He does not send viruses to attack us. He's not that kind of a God. He paid for all our sins. In the Old Testament, yeah, they got diseases put on them, but they knew what the disease was from. They knew why. But God took the curses on him. He took all of our judgment on him. A lot of people say this, this is a season of ju the judgments of God. I don't believe that. I believe God is good all the time. God is forming us, God is making us, God is blessing us, God has chosen us for a time like this. And we're in one of the greatest times of history. I was just asking my grandkids the other day, I said, what are you going to tell your children about this time? And one of them said, boring. <laughs> and the other one said, I'm going to tell them it was a time of uh, not going to school. It was a time of learning to study at home. It was uh, a time of uh, focusing. It was a time of thinking about my career and what I wanted to do. So the older one was much more thoughtful. The younger one was bored, which is pretty normal. But I'm asking you what, do you, what are you doing during this time? Because God's doing something in you. So the clincher of this whole thing is that God is using this for his purposes. So that what the enemy brought in for evil, God is using for his purposes. And just the fact that we're out online now to all the world is just amazing to me. Uh, the church has gotten bigger through this time. It hasn't gotten smaller. People think I can't go to church or they're shutting down the church. Or, or, or I, heard, I heard one person say, well, the church is probably going to die under this. The church isn't dying. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. The church is moving forward in this. The church is growing in this. The church's influence is growing immensely during this time. I just heard a one Bible college that's going online now. And, and they have thousands of thousands of people that have already applied to come. I, I listened to a pastor about a week and a half ago and said, all kinds of people are coming to the Lord online. He had a family of five call him and say, how do we get saved? Or, or another family that said, we just got saved. We just prayed the prayer. How do we join your church? And there's all kinds of new avenues growing up, going, uh, growing up within the church. So God's doing amazing things. So I just want you to be encouraged with that, that God doesn't, doesn't turn his face away from us in any way. Um, we miss each other uh, immensely. We love praying together. We love getting together. And some of you are on Zoom, and some of you are on calls, and you're talking to friends. And I FaceTime with my sisters and uh, did a chat time with uh, Carol Waggle and some of those people. And, and uh, Audrey and, and Penny Zielinski, we would just been uh, doing all kinds of little things just to um, enhance, to pray, to push forward in the midst of this and find what God is doing in our individual lives as well. So um, yes, the virus is part of the devil's plan, but three times during this pause, I've heard this word. And one time we were out on a, we were out uh, on the, at the reservation out in um, uh, Enumclaw, and we were praying. We were praying for the First Nations people. And we were at a church out there, and uh, uh, someone 
changed the subject and started praying for praying about the virus or something like that. And as soon as they did that, I, I heard a word and it was that uh, Haman is going to hang on his own gallows. And uh, I thought, what's that about? What that? What is that about? And then the second time I heard that word, we were down here in the prayer meeting and we were praying for our country and we we're praying for our nation and we we're praying about this virus. And I heard it again. Haman is going to hang on his own gallows. And and uh, the other day I was listening to a pastor, uh, Tim Sheets, preach. And at the end of his sermon, he, he said, uh, I believe that Haman is going to hang on his own gallows. And I believe that what the enemy has done here is there's all kinds of things that are coming up. They're coming up from the deep places. Uh, God's exposing things in our lives. He's exposing things in others. He's exposing stuff in government. Uh, he's exposing uh, things in the media. He's exposing things in the church. He's exposing things in our family. He's exposing things for a good purpose. And that is because he wants to heal. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God is healing us today. God's restoring us during this time. I am ready. I am pregnant with what the promises of God were over my life. Are you pregnant? Are you not forgetting the promises of God over your life? Are you not forgetting prophetic words? Are you keeping them? The devil wants to wear you out. He wants to run you down. But you are going to run with vigor. You're going to run with power. The Bible says, they who wait on the Lord shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the, and the, and the writer goes on to say, uh, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. And during this time as we're waiting on God, something's happening just so mighty in our lives, so powerful in our lives, that when we come out, there won't be anything that will stand against us. We're coming out in a boldness. We're coming out with greater courage than we ever had before. I believe God swinging wide doors for us to walk through, uh, opportunities to speak, opportunities to witness into someone's life, opportunities to heal people. I believe that God is softening hearts. God is doing something that's way beyond our imagination. He's bigger than us. He knows what he's doing. I trust in him. Do you trust in him today? Do you trust that God has all this worked out? Because I know that he does. And I hope that you are pregnant with the promises of God today because he will never, ever, ever fail you you and he's never going to fail us and some of you are out there today and you don't know Jesus you say who are you talking about this good God uh, there's all kinds of evil why does he allow evil look if he didn't allow any evil we'd all be dead so let's just break that conversation off right now and let and let me introduce you to a God that loves you with a passion that you could never even understand if you lived to be 200 years. But he's passionately in love with you. He cares about the brokenness of your life. He cares about the brokenhearted. He cares about the abused. He cares about the widow. He cares about the broken and he cares about the sick. He cares about those of you who have lost loved ones to this virus. He cares about you. It's, the Bible says that he is close to the brokenhearted. If you are brokenhearted today, if you are in a place today where you think you've gone too far, let me tell you, you have not gone too far. There's a God that loves you, that cares for you, that wants to turn your life around, that wants to give you a second chance, that wants to give you a chance to be everything he called you to be. He wants to forgive you. He's already paid the price for your sin. He hung on a cross. It's already paid for. It's a done deal. There's nothing you can do but come to him. Just come to him. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to change your life. I did it in a small chapel over here 40 some years ago. He changed my life in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, in a moment. He delivered me from all kinds of stuff. And he set me on the path that I'm on today. And I've never been sorry one day. He healed my wounds. He bandaged me up. He tutored me. He mentored me. He coached me. He loved me. And he'll do the same for you. Today's your day. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, let's just pray now. If you're in your living room today, let's just stand up before him. Father, I pray your beautiful presence of the Lord all over every person out there. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. Like you said you already did we accept that forgiveness we accept the 
price you paid on the cross for our failings, Lord. Father, would you come into my life today? Would you take away the sin? Would you take away the hurt? Would you bind me up, Lord? Would you bind up my wounds? Would you heal me, Lord? Would you set me on a path of righteousness for your name's sake, Lord? Will you bring me into my destiny, Lord? Will you bring my family into your destiny for us, Lord? Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for those who have prayed this prayer today that have come to Jesus. It's a come to Jesus day. I thank you for them. I thank you for their lives. I thank you for their families. And Lord, we're going to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day again.